How y'all doing? Good. Good. You're gonna be able to wait for this, oh, maybe. Who knows? Okay, so a couple housekeeping items. First, I am a cyclone. I have nothing to do with the downgrade of this horrible basketball season. So I'm not Steve prone. Save those questions for somebody like him, okay? I can't help at all. One. Two, we have the right butter today. Did anyone notice? This outstandingly great tasting butter. I don't care what your cardiologist says, shove this down your throat every day. As much as you can eat. Raw, salted, I don't care what you do with it. Just consume it because our dairy farmers need you, all right? Uh, last thing is what, what actually Don said. I encourage you all to interact. This is going to go a lot better if you ask some questions. Because otherwise, this is about 20 slides and you aren't going to want to have to see them all. So the more you ask, the less we have to show. How's that? We good there? See, that's not how this is supposed to go. That was a check and you failed, okay? That was a yes, we're ready to go. We get it, right? All right. So we're going to talk about sustainability, obviously, and, and what this really means to you all. I want to start it with, with kind of a little bit of a grounding of the topic. I know this may not be your most favorite topic in the world, okay? And I know you can probably have your own mixed feelings of, is this good? Is it bad? It really doesn't matter where it sits on that spectrum. What I'll show you today is that this is the journey we have in front of us. Whether we like it or not is not the topic. There's many things we have to do in agriculture over the years that we maybe liked or maybe didn't like. This is one of those that fall under that space. But what I hope to paint a picture in, in the one hour we've got is that this journey can be really good for ag and you personally. That's what we need to find in this. Instead of finding the negatives, and God knows there are plenty in this. I want you to try to work with me and find the positives that we can take out of this and how we can turn this somewhat challenging topic into something good for you. And I honestly believe that. So a little bit about me. I'm from uh, Bagley, Iowa. Does anybody here know where Bagley is? That's, a, that's about all that should know it, thank God. <laughs> so that's a population of about 200 when my family's all the way back. And I still live there today. I actually moved to Panora just a few miles from there. That's where we farm. Uh, we've got uh, 7,000 acres of corn and soy, most of corn, and then we've got 30,000 head of forever finch hogs that we uh, farm, uh, take care of on our own. We're not tied to any uh, specific company. And then we've got a little cow-calf operation that I don't know what we do with that, but uh, we think it's neat, so we do it. So that's a little bit about me, and I do this gig in Land Lakes that uh, really takes up most of my time, and, and that I love, because I love the cooperative system. I think a well-ranked cooperative like yours here at CFE is unbeatable. You cannot be a well ran cooperative. And you all are blessed with that here with, uh, with CFE and Atlanta Lakes as, as the, uh, the, the mother over a lot of this. Um, I think this system is really powerful and one that uh, I'm proud of to deal with topics like what we're having to deal with here. So the spotlight is on that. Not that that's news to you. You didn't have me drive all the way up here to tell you that. But it is an important fact that, that this has changed, particularly from a sustainability standpoint, of where, where we've been. This is not a political statement. I don't know if the spec sound is going to work here or not, so I'll, I'll give it a shot. But this is uh, Pete Buttigieg. He is a Democratic candidate for president. Uh, so again, it's not a political statement, so don't start calling me a Democrat or Republican because we're not going to have that discussion. But I'm showing you this because this is a part of everyday life. Every Democratic debate that they've had, this is actually a town hall of his, but every Democratic debate, the question of climate has come up. The answer to solve climate is ag in every case. And this thing of carbon sequestration. And Pete does as good as any in trying to attack this. So let me see if the sound happens. And if not, we'll, we'll just verbally talk about it. We need to put climate at the center of our diplomacy so that other countries uh, are being held to account for how much they're part of the solution. There's one other thing that's not being talked about so much, which is how rural America, places like the Central Valley, could be a huge part of the solution. You know, there are some estimates that through better soil management, soil could capture a level of carbon equivalent to the entire global transportation industry. And if we let rural America know that they could be one of the most important parts of the solution, and then instead of just being feeling like they're being told that they're part of the problem, we might be able to break down some of the resistance, especially at a moment when rural America is beginning to realize, because of this extreme weather, that 
where I live is making it hard uh, to see whether it's even worth planting soy this year, for example, because some of the fields are so waterlogged after a lot of extreme weather. Uh, you know, they have the most to lose. Okay, so you get the, the gist of that, right? Which is uh, ag or rural could be a part of the solution, a big part of the solution, because the biggest emissions of greenhouse gases is the transportation and energy industry. That's what he cites. And the farmers have the ability to sequester carbon into their uh, soils, store it, which is where carbon actually belongs in your soils, and be able to get paid for that. That's his, that's his premise, which actually I think is fairly accurate. There is carbon markets today. Ag doesn't participate in those for many reasons. We can talk about those offline if you'd like. Um, but at the end of the day, there is absolutely a path forward here that I think really is, is interesting. And you're hearing this in every of those presidential debates. You're actually hearing from the current White House administration. Now that it's become a topic that they can see it may have an actual benefit for rural, I think you're going to see our current president run some uh, ads and some things in this space as well try to create a secondary market for agriculture. So there is some good spins to this. We have a mile to go on this thought of carbon sequestration and paying farmers. So please do not leave here and call up the, your local CFE in person and go, hey, when am I going to get paid? That answer is not soon. I don't know if that's two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, but I think there is a path pending how this, uh, this presidential debate goes, how funding at the federal level goes, uh, I think there's some paths here that, that seem interesting to me. And I just wanted to share that with you, that this is what the consumers see as we kind of switch gears here and, and look at them a little bit. Does anybody know what this uh, picture is? Don's got 10 bucks to get it right. Lake Erie, Chesapeake Bay. Lake Erie, Chesapeake Bay. Those are all good answers. Really good. Uh, it is. It is. What's that? Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico. So actually, this one is Lake Erie. But you can mistake this for Gulf of Mexico because it's very similar. So I don't know who got that right. Um, good luck, Payne. Uh, <laughs> you're running good line. Rob? He's <laughs> passing the buck here. Uh, so what we see here is, is the algae bloom that, that uh, occurs when phosphorus gets into our, our, our water. The problem with this is that Toledo pulls their drinking water right from, from this lake here, right from this spot that they've got this picture of. If you go back three years ago, I think it was Mariah, where's Mariah? Somewhere there. Good. Three years ago was that right when they shut the drinking water down in Toledo. Uh, so it took hundreds and hundreds of uh, thousands of employer, uh, citizens out of water and to uh, truck it in. It's a mess. This is what ag gets in. And there's no way to hide from this. I know you may be going, well, tell them it was the golf courses, Matt. It's not the golf courses, okay? Not that they help, but a majority of this issue, 90, 95% of this is ag. It is what it is. You shouldn't be ashamed of it. Uh, we can change it. But these are the facts. And this is what the population sees. This type of headline about drinking water for hundreds of thousands of Americans made it all across the globe. This is what people saw in any country that, that wanted to read this article about this issue. So we need to have that backdrop of understanding what the consumers really see. Um, and there's other stories that come along with this. I'll pop these up. You can read them as they come up. And then all right, what's this? Particularly, what's that? That's you all, right? That's right where we're at. What's going on right now? Particularly where we're sitting or standing here right now. What's some of the topics that you all are getting hit with? So once again, this is participation, audience interaction. There's no wrong answer. I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm not that smart. You already know I went to Iowa State, so let's take this where we're at, okay? Uh, come on, now we're just getting mad. Iowa State's great. Uh, what, what's going on here? What, what are you all doing? Watershed. Watersheds and the issue with watersheds, whether it's nitrates, animal waste, right? Those types of things. Very good. What else? How does Des Moines feel about you all? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not very happy, right? They're blaming you for their drinking water here all the way down through the Raku going into the water, right? Everybody knows that. I'd say that's right. I definitely don't agree with that. I think you guys are awesome. Uh, my wife's from this area up here, so I think you guys are great. Uh, you guys feed the world. But we have to deal with some of these challenges that we're getting hit with. And you know there's a lot more to the story, right? Just because, God rest his soul, Bill Stone thought it was wrong and you just got need to be sued and whatever, whatever, that doesn't make it right. But that's what Des Moines knows this as. That's what they think of. 
And before we pick on them as consumers, I think it's important to understand if you sit in their seat, what have we done collectively to change that narrative? I'm not saying we haven't done anything, but I ask you, do you feel good about the narrative we're giving them to change this? Have we done our jobs? Here's a little case study for you. For $100, you can't be a CFE employee. Rob Pace, what percent of the nitrogen applied in the United States has a stabilizer with it? From one of the great companies, Corteb is here, several others that have stabilizers. This is a product you put in your nitrogen that keeps it, and the top profile is more usable for the corn, so whatever you're applying. Okay, what percent of our nitrogen in the U.S. has a stabilizer applied? Very simple question. You all would agree, right? This is not brain surgery. Okay? Very simple question. Very simple. What's the answer? Give me a simple answer. 30%? 5? 22%? 30%. 3? 3? Okay, what else? 2. 2? Keep going. $100 safe. 10%? 1. 1? Did I hear 1? Good. First, those are really low answers. So I don't know what you all are doing up here, but you need to sell more and buy more stabilizer, okay? <laughs> but the answer is... We don't know. Congratulations, money's yours. Think about this. What do you want me to tell Los Angeles when I go there in the next couple months? What do you want me to tell them? They've got a very simple question for you. There's outstanding technology. It's here today. Helps pre prevent some of this problem. Why can't we answer that? Or better yet, why aren't we using it at 70, 80, 90%? Why weren't that our guesses? We actually think the number's about a third, by the way but there's no great way of knowing. Here's another case study for you. What percent of the nitrogen applied in Iowa is done in more than one application? So we're feeding the plant through its life cycle. What percent of Iowa's nitrogen is applied in more than one application? 10? 25? We don't know. We have no idea on that. We think maybe 50%. Nobody can actually answer that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the problem. I'm not in love with the consumers either, okay? There's days I want to wring their necks. By the way, we are all one, by the way. So, a little dangerous statement. But I get it. If you put yourself in their shoes, when we can't answer the most basic of questions, what, what are we saying about this? Think about that. We have a job to do here. It's not just good enough anymore to produce a ton of grain, a bunch of meat, sell it to the market, and say our job's done. Because the truth is, a consumer has a right to know these facts. You could argue that, I'd let you, it'd be a nice little fun debate. But my ending statement would be, why? This is what they're putting in their body. They should be able to know this, if they would like. I love where we've been for many, many years. What percent of the population today is directly or indirectly tied to agriculture? What percent of the U.S. population do you think? Five percent. Five? Four, two. Two. Two percent. Eighty, ninety years ago, that was 30, 35 percent. That's a major change. And now we have something called Facebook, which I think I'm on right now, or something. Uh, social media in general. We can't be mad at them. We've got to change the narrative. We have to answer these questions, be able to address these concerns. I put this slide up to give you a little confidence in this. I've got a couple statistics I'll show you. Uh, beyond me, you see you got the almond milk there. Anybody know how you milk an almond? I have no idea, but you can Google it, and actually we'll have a nice little comedy act for you, so Google that. Uh, the Impossible Burger all the way there, Annie's Organic Mac and Cheese, made by a company in Minneapolis. Uh, I want to talk about Impossible. I was at a conference uh, last week that the Impossible CFO came to speak to, okay? And uh, I was like, well, this is going to be all about vegan and veggie and blah, 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 blah. But it will be fine, no big deal. They have had one of the strongest, most successful food launches ever in our country's history. Almost every grocery store, almost every fast food restaurant, wants their product. And they luckily, or unlucky, depending on how you want to look at it, if you don't stock it, maybe unlucky, they can't get even close to providing it. So I think there are maybe two today, uh, Burger King and White Castle. What is, what is it? 
So Impossible Burger is plant-based ground beef. So there's no beef in it. It's ground up plants that has the look, feel, texture of beef. So you squeeze it and it'll have maybe a little blood run out of it. I don't know what that is. Don't ask me, but it is blood from an animal. All right? That's what that is. 22 or more ingredients, by the way. Some has more, some has less. 22 or more ingredients. Clearly, this is not healthier for you. So what's their message? Like I said, I already thought it would be vegan, something in that space, whatever. We move on to the next speaker. Their market is sustainability. They're selling this to more beef eaters than they ever thought in their wildest imagination because of the environment. Taking three meals a day with some kind of animal protein and taking that to something less than three and making the consumer feel good about this. And it's working. They can't put it off on the shelf. It's not even close. Far exceeded their imagination of what they thought they could do. This, ladies and gentlemen, is your consumer. Like it, hate it, I don't care. But I do know we need to deal with it. We have to change the narrative. They're not giving the full truth. They're not giving the full truth. Go ahead, tell me about that. What's not the full truth there? It's 22 ingredients. You actually look at the science to it. Yeah. So health, you're saying? The, the health of the burger, yeah. basically, yeah. actually has a higher carbon footprint. Yeah so, he's, yeah, so what he's saying is the uh, carbon footprint's actually less with the impossible burger with the versus beef, is what you're saying. No, it's more. It's, it's more, sorry, more. You're right, more. Um, so we have to talk about that offline. I'm interested in your math. My math would disagree with that. But I, I don't, listen, let the science talk. It is what it is. Uh, the problem we have is, I don't know, we don't have a lot of data on this. I just gave you two examples. What percent of both examples, and we can't answer it. We have an obligation here to change that. So as we talk, here's some more statistics up there. I appreciate your comment, by the way, um, of kind of where consumers are at. Are they willing to pay more? 35%, this was back in 2014. I think today, Mariah, wherever she is, you were saying uh, that number's jumped to 70% would be willing to pay 30% more for a product. There's your consumer. And Impossible Burger is obviously living proof of that. I think at White Castle, the sliders are 99 cents. If it's an impossible one, it's almost three bucks. What's the price for organic corn? Organic corn, nine, 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 over nine bucks. It's clearly a consumer somewhere is paying for that. Now that may or may not be because of, more of uh, sustainable reasons, but I'm giving these examples that they're in this game. They're playing. It's not just good enough for us to deliver our commodity wherever we deliver to, whatever the commodity is. We've got to be able to have the data that backs the story. This is not doom and gloom. How many of you mobile or plow? Quick show of hands. Thank God, by the way, that's a good answer. But how many of you mobile or plow 45, 50 years ago? Let's put your hands up. Let's be honest. Mine's up too. Yeah, almost everyone. That's progress. That's a story we can absolutely sell. We've got to start finding those. We have to have the data to back the actions that we're doing. And that's as simple as this is. All the consumer's asking us for is transparency. That's a fair ask. I want you to feel comfortable with that ask. There's nothing wrong with that. You have nothing to hide, right? I'm not saying we have a perfect industry, but we have nothing to hide. Am I right in that? This is participation. Hang in there with me. We're okay, right? We have nothing to hide, so let's tell them. Let's show them the good work we're doing. Let's have conferences like this and show the progress that we're making, the changes we're making in the amount of cover crop being used, the amount of no-till being used, the amount of tillage systems and, and tile lines and that, that we're putting in place, and where we're going, more importantly. I think our past is something we should absolutely be proud of, but I think our future is even more impressive because we do have our eyes set on something that's, that's a bigger product that the consumer will absolutely love. Consumers see farmers the same as they see puppy dogs. Proven statistic. Farmers, puppy dogs, they love them both. I'll give you a story of this and then we'll move on. We do ethnography, which is really about uh, going in our butter business and doing uh, in-home, in-kitchen tours 
to kind of ask them why they're doing as a consumer what they're doing, particularly around dairy products, okay? There's this one that uh, our dairy business talks about that uh, was a flight attendant, and she had a friend there, and a lot of different questions, but one of the questions they asked is there was an apple cider vinegar container on the counter. So clearly, she's using that fairly regularly, right? We ask, the, the interviewer asks, what's that, what's that there for? What are you doing with that? She goes, oh, I take it once a day, a tablespoon of this for my, I think it's for my gut health. And she had a friend there, and the friend goes, no, I think it's actually something to do with muscular or something. And then she goes, no, actually, I think it's helped to retain more, so, something for my brain. And she turns to the camera and says, I don't know why I take it, but Dr. Oz told me to. <laughs> now, if you had apple cider vinegar before, let me assure you, if I take a drop of that, I'm going to know dang good well why I'm taking that stuff, right? And she's like, oh, I'm not exactly sure what Dr. Oz said. But then we go into the fridge, many other questions. Go into the fridge, everything's organic, uh, sustainable, blah, 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 blah. What would you probably expect? Why? She goes, well, it's better for the planet. It's better for me. We go, what if we told you, particularly around uh, non-GMO versus GMO, that the farmer decides what they're planted and it helps the farmer be more profitable and helps them be more sustainable with their land? <coughs> she goes, no, no, not the truth. She goes, well, who does decide that thing? Hold on. We're in Charlotte, North Carolina. Are you with me? Who do you think she says decides whether you have farmer plants in a non-GMO or GMO? She cites the word Monsanto. <laughs> I'll let that sink in for a minute. She cites the words Monsanto. So this goes on and the interviewer goes, what if I can assure you it's the farmer that decides and it's good for their land, good for sustainability, good for our planet, blah, 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 good, 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 good. She thinks for uh, what probably was just a few seconds, felt like at least a half a minute. Once again, turns to the camera and says, I guess if it's good for the farmer, then it's good for me. I trust the farmer. So I share that with you to say, no matter what somebody stands in front of you and tells you how tough it is with the consumer, and it is, they've got an expectation. We've got a secret weapon, which is their trust of you and the fact that you are the original conservationist. No farmer wakes up and goes, I am so stoked to send CFE money for nitrogen that's going to be lost to the planet. Right? That is not happening here, right? Raise your hand if that's happening. Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so we're all on the same page here, right? You want this too. We need to do a better job. And I look no further than my own company, Atlanta Lakes, at doing a better job of providing the technologies, the tools, the people with expertise to work with CFE to really make this difference and drive the change. And that's what we'll talk about for a minute. So, there are more statistics. We'll move on from there. How's that picture coming through? We'll go to this one. So, the story for us is about transparency. The solution is really clear. It's about data. Data, data, and more data. And I know what you're going to say. No farmer loves to give up their data. I get it. I absolutely understand where you're at. We're the same on our farm as well. But if we don't have the data aggregated as a collective group like you open with on, then what are we going to tell them? How do we answer these questions? Trust is running out. Hope is running out. The challenges you're dealing with in the counties up here in Northwest Iowa is no greater anywhere else. It's your data that is aggregated and protected that they can never come back to a single farm, farmer, or even a community that will allow us to put this all together and tell the story. I believe data is our new goal. The currency of agriculture will center around data moving forward. What if I told you that I personally believe, and this is true, that data could be worth more than the commodities you produce someday? You think that's possible? I mean, it's my opinion. But I've got data points that I can show you and make you feel comfortable that for sure data is going to play a role in this. Just like the delivery of your commodity, we've got to have the story of how it was produced, why it was produced that way, and what's the effects of that 
on you and your business, the environment, at an aggregated level. Never will your data be exposed and shared. That's not how this works. There's contracts, legal binding agreements, all that that go along with it. But the plea I give you, the ask for your support is this. Engaging with CFE on true tariff and the sustainability work around data is our path forward. If you've got another suggestion, please get my phone number. I think I have it at the end, my email address. Call, write, text, tweet, whatever at me. I'd be happy to listen to another path forward. But I will assure you in our dialogue, we'll get down to the brass tacks of data is our path forward. But there's also a benefit to the data piece. We know over 100 data points on any given farm. When you take those over 100 data points on a single farm, and calculate it and come back to you with raw data around what you're doing and what it works and what's the profitability, we can win. It puts the control back in your hands. It absolutely does that. Today we know these data points, but they're not in the central system that allows us to engage with you in a way that talks about what you've done historically and what the algorithms to the future will look like. And that's our path. What I'll tell you with data is this. If the data is used in a way that doesn't show you equal to or better profitability, do not do it. You should stop immediately. Because data is only worthwhile if it's going to help you as a farmer be more successful. And I don't care if that's CFE, Land lakes, anyone else you want to deal with. Until the data can help you be equal to or better in profitability, don't do it. That's an absolute requirement you should have of CFE, of land and lakes, of anybody that you deal with. So, showing you a little bit of this uh, in our system. Um, let me get to some slides here and have a little meaning to it. So, what we do with this data is really start on farm, bringing you the practices, products, technologies that allow you to be profitable and improve the environment, so use of stabilizers. Use of high response nitrogen hybrids, no till, buffer strips, uh, well shaped waterways that has the right seeding, the right depth, the right width, all the things you can farm through but still have the grass and that all season long. Though. All those things helping you be successful. And that is what you should expect from CFE. That's what they should expect from Land O'Lakes. That is a job we should do. No longer there's somebody that I had lunch with, uh, there she is. They was talking about price, you know, and the, the old adjective was a lot of just going price and everybody wants, I get it, I want to buy well too. But at some point the narrative has to change to the right products, at, yes, the right price, that helps improve your profitability, that gives agriculture that story, that protects your land. These are your acres, your livestock. Why wouldn't we want to take better care of them? If there was a tool that allowed you to have that data showed you a better path forward, only until it shows you a better path forward, should you engage. And it's 2020, people. Think about all the things we can do outside of agriculture. Why not bring that to agriculture? Algorithms are used, I don't know if you know what an algorithm is, but it's a computer that does smart things with all the data that comes back and says, given your acres, given your livestock, here's what you should expect in 2020, 2021, 2022. Take some guesswork out of it. You don't have to wonder what's going to happen to your yield, to your profit, to your land. It's going to tell you. I am shocked at the amount of erosion that our tool reports. In most cases, I think we're at over 50 uh, dump trucks on any given field. I mean, that's like 50 times 20 is the amount of tons that we're losing on average, or somewhere in that ballpark, depending on where you're at, how you're farming, on average. I don't know looking across the room with any of you that want that. But we've never had that technology. You've never had that at your disposal. Now we're opening up the ability through CFE for you to be able to answer any of these questions anytime they are at. And then we aggregate that data and take it all the way downstream on the product side to where you see products in the grocery store that reflect you. That reflect the great work that farmers do across our country. 
I love telling this story. I hope you don't mind that um, I was speaking at an event uh, one Saturday at, uh, in Iowa at the, at the State House. I'm on my way home, my wife says, hey, we're going to Panora. We stopped at a little Panora uh, store and grab a, a, a bottle of, uh, of lemonade. Sure, no problem, because you know what that's going to be making. Vodka lemonade, so I'll wait. Absolutely, I'll stop and get lemonade. That's a, kind of a key component of this. Stop in there, go to the back of the store. Remember, this is Panora, Iowa. There's nothing but hogs, cows, and corn and soybean. That's all there is around this place. Okay? This is as rural as rural gets. I go to the back of the store, because that's how they make you do it, right? Get all the way to the back to get the stuff that people most commonly want. There sits all the, the lemonades, right? That was one, because it's a small store. So one is the choice of lemonade. What's wrapped around the top of this lemonade? The lid. There's a lid with a wrapper around it. So you got to break this wrapper to get, what does it say? Non-GMO. Lemonade. Are you following me? No? There's no such thing as GMO lemons. Or water. You hang in there with me? This is what we're at. This is where we're at. We have to change that narrative. We have to get that story down to where you, you can walk through a grocery store and recognize the work that you do. Who in here has been to a high end? Quick show of hands. Get some fun. That's all. You all don't eat around here? You just come to the co-op and eat when they're serving food and you kind of pass between them? Is that what you do? Times are tough. They are tough, aren't they? I'm starting to like you all. Maybe I can lose a little bit by coming up here and living with you all. But when you walk through a high a Walmart, it doesn't matter. Any grocery store, what do you see? You see antibiotic-free. You see non-GMO. You see organic. You, see, you recognize this stuff? That's what you see. And my contention is that's not right. That doesn't reflect what agriculture is doing. And we need people like CFE to engage in this discussion, to help that journey, making you profitable, doing the right things on the land, and aggregating that all the way to the end. We have an agreement right now that I'm really proud of with Tate Wild. The Tate Wild is a very large high fructose corn syrup and starch provider to many food companies. And today we're working with uh, one of the beverage companies, which I can't talk about, that, uh, that sells a lot of different sodas and juices and that, to where every acre of corn now, that company can track and can tell a sustainability story of why high fructose corn was produced in a way that was good for them, that's good for our planet. Now that's a good story, right? We've aggregated the data, over 300,000 acres, provided that company to put on the label to tell the story all the way through. And Tate Lyle led that charge. Today, Tate Lyle sells 1.5 million acres worth of corn to the food industry. Every acre of theirs now can be tracked on a sustainable impact. <coughs> Any of those companies that want to tell your authentic story, that's a win. Now we're moving the needle in a direction where we go into a grocery store and recognize these great products that, uh, that we have on the shelves. But we can't do it alone. It's going to take all of us in ag, food, and government pulling that direction. Because at the end of the day, people are going to question, right? Even though farmers are behind us, you won't see a fee, they own us, it's a great system. We need partners to pull us along. Here's a list of all of the different partners today that are working with CFE and us to make these claims to do the work that's needed to be done in a successful manner. Um, from NGOs to government to private businesses like Yes and Purina, you see Tate Lyle up there, some universities. Campbell Soup Company does something very similar to Tate Lyle for goldfish crackers and Milano cookies. So if you're in a grocery store, grab a bag or two of those, just like you do butter. And uh, I don't care if you dump them out on the way home, just to keep buying it and tell them. We're proud of the work that a company like Campbell's is doing with, uh, with those goldfish crackers and Milano cookies. So the tool I'm really referencing here is called the True Terra Insights Engine. This is a technology that takes, uh, I think, over a trillion algorithms to calculate on any given field what's happened historically, but more so what the future will hold if you change practices, products, technologies on it. Okay? So I want to show you just a few very quick screenshots, and then we'll get into some Q&A and let me up for a while, and that'll be fun. Okay? We're good there? All right. So the tool really does these simple things on the left. It gives you a one single insight score, anywhere from zero to 100. Zero means we've got a little bit of work to do, maybe a lot. 
100 means you're maxing out the capabilities from an environmental standpoint. You're doing necessary things on that field to protect the land and, and our planet. It gives you yield and profit insights. Not only what you've historically done, but you already will have known that, but what the changes that you would make in the future to an environmental impact, what effects that will have to your bottom line. When I told you I was serious about you making money, I wasn't joking. You need to balance every decision against your profit. If you're not here to do that because you're broke being more sustainable, to your, what good did that do? I mean, now you don't even get to come for the free dinners and fast in between the meals they serve you, right? That's a lose. We want to see our farmers doing well and producing more, and particularly being more profitable for them. I give this speech in, in many, many, many places. I've yet to have one audience member, either on social media, in the meeting, afterwards, ever question me whether your profitability should be at or above where you're currently at. So we've won that back. They understand and appreciate the fact that your profitability needs, a part, needs to be part of this. Nitrogen use efficiency. This is a big deal. I can't stand in front of you and tell you you're using too much nitrogen, not enough nitrogen, not my gift. We sell nitrogen to CFE, so I hope it's, we need more. But the truth is, what if it's less? Let's use the technology we have to be able to tell you what the right rate of nitrogen is and how we spoon feed that over the different application methods you make or the different systems that you have to continue to feed that. What happens when you apply your nitrogen and you get two inches of rain, which happens about every spring? Where, where's that nitrogen at? This is not your question. There's a very simple answer to this question. Where is your nitrogen once you've applied it after a two-inch rain? Down the creek. Now again, none of you are excited about that, right? You pay for that nitrogen, right? You know when people steal it? They're paying most of them generally, not. generally not let me steal it. Okay. Good. So we're there. So you don't want this. We don't want this. Nobody wants this. How do we use this tool to tell you based on your farming practices, based on your weather patterns, your soil types, here's the best way to protect that. Whether it's a, a stabilizer for one of the great companies that are here today. Whether it's using high response hybrids to nitrogen that use more nitrogen efficiency. Whatever the case may be, how do we do that? How do we use soil quality and erosion insights? Again, on average, plus or minus, we're losing 50 20 ton dump trucks on a given field. I know you don't want that. But when I drove up here, it was uh, Don and, and, Jim and Rob, it was what, about, about six months ago I drove up here, right? Right in the summer. And looking at the number of cricks that we're farming right up to, looking at the amount of erosion that's eating away at the cricks, we gotta change this. I'm not yelling at you. I'm looking in the mirror first. We have not provided you the technology through CFE to help guide that discussion and drive the changes that are really necessary. And last, you may or may not know what this is, but Field Trend Calculator is the food industry's calculation of farms of how they're doing from a sustainability standpoint. So all of the food in there, most of the food industry has stacked hands on an organization uh, that uses this field print calculator, and that's kind of the buffer. We provide those reports to them. As a farmer, you can get that calculation as well. Not as valuable as what the rest of this is, but it's something that's available to you. So there's screenshots like this, which I'm showing you, so I didn't hide it, but that really does the back work of, of the conservation side. What your tillage practices is. Are you using cover crops? Uh, are you using the stabilizers? We reported for the insights factors, if you can look all the way to the very top, that's a field. It's scored in 18, so uh, from 0 to 100, it's scored in 18. Um, you can see we scored out in management stewardship, soil and nitri or nutrient loss mitigation, and conservation adoption. If you go over there to the right, you see that we've expanded one of those areas uh, of soil quality. It gives you a definition of how we define soil quality, and what your soil quality score is and why, and some of the practices you can change. Under this example, the, what I did here was changed a couple factors. I think I added uh, reduced tillage instead of conventional tillage and added cover crop. Now if you go back up to the top, kind of where that little yellow box is, 42, if you do just those two things, on this field, cover crop and taking uh, your uh, tillage to a strip till situation, you're going to gain 24 points and take your score from 18 to 42. Now, at this point, I've not said whether that's going to make you any money or not, but I'm showing you some of the backdrop of the things that can be done. We can also pull up in this lower left-hand box your nitrogen use efficiency, your sheet rail erosion, wind erosion, look at any field, 
and see if the same part of that field is a problem for all of those areas where you're getting your most erosion, where you're having the least nitrogen efficiency or nitrogen use uh, that's not having an impact to your bottom line. What's amazing to me is when we actually did this, I thought that's going to be a real wasteful part. It's a really interesting part when you see on some of these fields, the pieces of those fields that should just be put in CRP or something different, some other use of it, how it drives your profitability. When we stop putting resources in those two, three, four, five, ten acre spots that aren't profitable, how it makes you more profitable, how it protects our planet better. And I fail to see where that's a bad day. That doesn't mean you have to do it. You're in control. But at least we need to have CFE put that in front of you and show you the cause and effects of every acre. And where there may be better options to use with government funding, maybe a pheasants uh, forever type of funding, whatever the case may be. So there you kind of see the, the same thing we're looking at, just the slide I had before, played with some of the things on the right, so you get a, a feel for that. Um, same thing there. I'm going to skip a few to get to so what I promised you was that CFE would be able to show you not only your environmental impacts, what parts of fields should be done differently, but most importantly, show you profitability. So what you see here, way on the left, is the, on the left top, is the statistics based on this is a field in 2018, what was done in 2018. So what you're seeing there is this is the behind Joe's field, it's 124.7 acres, it was corn in 2018. Now for 2019, the customer went in with their uh, with CFE and shows what options they wanted to look at. Here they just wanted to look at what's called profit-focused uh, conservation cover, which is cover crop. One thing you need to know is we've changed the words in a lot of cases just because there's some stigma to some of these things in the past. So we're trying to maybe change the narrative a little bit to open up people's minds that maybe some of this stuff that we've scoffed at in the past may not be as bad as we think. What if we had an open mind to what that means? So then you look at this middle column. What you see first is a heat map of profit per acre. So red is bad, green is good, yellow is in between. So you see a part of this field that actually uh, is not very profitable. So actually, I said this was cover crop. What they actually chose was uh, CRP. So then you can see in 2018, that 124 acres had 170 bushels. Uh, its profit was six dollars an acre for 877, uh, or sorry, lost six dollars an acre for a loss of 877 dollars or a negative 0.8 ROI. This field, as we already knew, scored an 18. This field lost 27.7 20 ton dump trucks of soil through soil erosion. Its soil quality is actually pretty good because this is up here in northwest Iowa. And its emissions, it admitted 16.6 passenger cars of greenhouse gas, okay? Why do we talk about dump trucks and passenger cars at this point? It seems kind of weird, right? Why do you think we're doing it? Consumer, right? So we can convert it for the CPG. CPG is a consumer packaged goods company, so like a Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Tyson, Hormel, they're all CPGs, and their people kind of struggle with this too, right? How do you relate to them, let alone the consumer? So then what we look at on the way right is what happens if we did CRP in that red? What happened? Take it out of production, go in. So now you see they're only farming 109.8 acres. The yield goes up, uh, went up, or will go up to 80, uh, 180 bushels. The profit now goes from losing $6 an acre to making $37.5 an acre for a total of roughly $5,400 on the field. So an overall net swing of over $6,000 of profitability. The inside score jumps to a 41. The soil erosion goes down by 12 20-ton dump trucks. Soil quality is still good. And the uh, emissions drops by one car. Now, this is one scenario on that field. We can do this all day long. We can run anything your heart desires on this field until the farmer of this field decides what's best for him or her. I don't care what the solution is. As long as they're making more money and it's better for the environment and their field, I'm happy. You're happy. Society's happy. Now I ask you, and I want your participation, have you seen a tool like this before in your life? Thank God, Mariah. That's a good sign, right? This is going to be a real long meeting from this point forward. There's no reason we shouldn't be giving you access to tools like this. Through your trusted advisor, the local cooperative, 
this is what we should be doing. Although I recognize the importance of price and delivery and custom app and all the great things that is done here at CFE, this is the start of the journey. This is where we need to be sitting down with you and talking about the path forward in a way that resonates with you. Not all about beyond need or not all about whatever. Not important. What's important is what's important to you. Your profit, your stewardship of the land. And allowing us to take this success, if this is what the farm actually implemented, and talk about it with yours and yours and yours and yours on an aggregated basis. To give a company that produces beverages a chance to better talk about how you made an impact with your corn production that has the high fructose corn syrup in that product or whatever the case may be. This is the journey that we're really on and I'm really excited about it because I do believe it can help change the game. That one doesn't show, but I'll, I'll talk to it. Sorry, it's not showing. But um, we also, in the future, will be able to generate a map of that field and show you the amount of carbon sequestration. There it is. That you can do. So in this case, uh, green is good, orange is not sequestering much, and then run scenarios on how you can sequester more carbon. So if there becomes a viable market for carbon, you're going to be able to play. We're going to be able to report the carbon that you sequester. We're going to be able to give you the tools to make this green and orange map more green in the future. So modeling those solar results real time is, is a powerful part of it. So we've come to the point where you get to meet me up. So if you're on Twitter, you can follow me there. There's my email address. I'm not hiding from you. There's our uh, website for True Terry Insights. You can get on there and look at more of the scenarios, more of the statistics, things of that nature. And it's an exciting uh, opportunity. I ask you here as we get to the Q&A part of this is our time. The people that came before us had their own set of challenges, which was really, quite truthfully, the generations before us was really about feeding the world. How do we produce more grain to ensure nobody goes to bed at night hungry? More animals to ensure nobody goes to bed at night hungry? Now, our time is how do you not only do that, but do it in a way that ensures we're going to have soil for our animals to live on, to produce the food that it takes to feed them, to feed the humans that we do. And this is our grand challenge. 